Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com, and you know what? Serverless sucks. Or does it? There seems to be a never-ending supply of tweets and blog posts that I read that state that serverless is a tire fire and you should really just be using traditional servers. The problem is they're usually not describing at all the context in which why they came up with that opinion. It's just blanket statements saying why it sucks or why they don't like it. But let's get down to, I think, what are the core parts of serverless that really isn't talked about enough that can really sway you or kind of guide you in the direction of, will it work in your context or might not be a good idea? I want to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. Seemingly every month there's a post where somebody says that they have a $100,000 bill for some serverless cloud infrastructure that they have that ran wild for some reason, or posts like this. They had 600,000 visitors and 1 million API calls in a month on a $7 server, a $7 server. So why on earth would you possibly use serverless? And a $7 server worked for that, so it's gotta work for everybody in every possible use case, right? But blanket statements don't get you very far on Twitter. And then this was the subsequent reply of, yes, you can save six bucks a month if you host on AWS. Or yes, serverless may be cheaper. Yes, if it's not that many requests. There's a lot more than this to it about context, but for seven a month, uh, dollars a month, they got peace of mind. It was easy to deploy, easy to manage, and no surprise costs. For them, that was okay. But assuming your context is everybody else's context, eh. And this one is my favorite. F serverless, use traditional servers. I don't need to elaborate. Just host a normal Node.js server on Railway, Render, DigitalOcean, whatever, and save yourself the headache. All my apps are shipped this way. And if you can't tell from my sarcasm, this absolutely kills me. And why it kills me is because they're providing no information about the circumstance or why they hold these opinions. And if you watch any of my videos, then you'll know why. Because context is king. Always context is king. There's no issue with saying that serverless is a tire fire, dot, 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 in this particular context where I had X, Y, and Z. It didn't work for me for these reasons of what my requirements were. You got to provide context about why something may not fit or it does fit. Things evolve. Things are changed. Maybe in one circumstance, as it was at the very beginning, it worked fine, and then things evolved and things changed, and it didn't fit. That's exactly what happened to a team at Amazon Prime Video over a year ago when they posted this. I'm going to have a link to a video that I've done about this at the end of this video, but it talks about the exact same thing, about it started one way, it changed, serverless didn't fit where they landed. Okay, so where does serverless fit? Well, I want to focus on one particular use case that I don't really see talked about enough, or it's kind of glossed over a little bit in my eyes because people are often talking about scaling. And usually when they're talking about scaling, they're more referring to scaling up in the sense of, well, I can just infinitely scale. The more load, the more work that I have to do, I can just infinitely scale up to cover that. Not really. But first, it's actually my focus really is actually the reverse of that is scaling down. So one way of thinking of it is just your workload and how variable is it? I'm not talking about kind of like your nine to five and you kind of have your peaks and valleys. Sure, you can auto scale depending on that. I'm talking about how real variable is your workload. And it, that could be, it could be because it's just very unpredictable. So I don't mean this, like this is your typical nine to five type thing, work day where during the night our load is really low and then as the morning picks up through midday and then we drop down again, we're kind of during those business hours, we have higher load. I'm not really referring to this because if we were to look at this kind of over our week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the weekend, it's really low. We could just have some auto scaling depending on the services that we're using to accommodate for this. I'm more referring to this where you have some type of load that's kind of sporadic. It's there's really no rhyme or reason potentially that we know at the time. It could be, it's just completely variable and your days may look similar to this. Um, the, the next day that you could look at this, it could be completely different in terms of how it spikes. It's just very variable. Or it might look something like this, where every other hour we have a spike in load, but in between that, there's absolutely nothing. And it's easy to look at those charts and be focused on the peaks, like, oh, that's what we need to scale to. But really what I'm thinking about is the reverse. Like I mentioned, I'm actually looking at the valleys when we have little to no workload. That's really what I care about because I don't want to pay for resources that I'm not using all the time. I don't want to provision some resource that has some CPU, compute, et cetera, 
for the maximum load that I need to experience randomly variable? No, I just want to pay for what I'm using. A great example of this is a cron job or some type of scheduled recurring job that you have that needs to execute every few hours that has the same type of load. It starts up, does the work, stops. That's the end of it. You paid for its execution. Could you do this with other type of cloud infrastructure? Sure, does serverless fit this bill? Yes. Another simple use case is maybe you're picking up messages off a of queue. Instead of having some process container, et cetera, that's just sitting there running idle most of the time looking for work to do, rather you just have some type of serverless function that's triggered when a message actually hits the queue. But the point I'm trying to make is look at the values as a way to indicate maybe that's a good place, maybe that's a good use case. The thing is, is that when you look at the peaks and you're thinking about scaling for those peaks, there's a problem there. Is that depending on what you're using it for, depending on what type of execution you're having with this workload, you likely have other downstream services that also need to scale. If you just have some workload, say it's an HTTP API where it has to hit a database, well, you can't just infinitely scale all the work that's gonna hit the database because you're gonna overwhelm the database. You're just kind of moving the bottleneck everything ultimately will have to scale. So it really isn't so much about thinking about the peaks for me as a as an indicator, one good way, just one good way, there's many, but one of them is looking at the valleys. So does serverless suck? No, of course not. Those statements are absolutely absurd, but so are equally absurd are the ones that are saying that you should only be using serverless and serverless everywhere. There's context, just like in that Amazon Prime video, link at the end here, their context changed. It worked, then it didn't work. Context is king. You have to understand your context, understand the use cases of the technology, no matter what you're using, does it fit? Then go from there. And of course, there's always different solutions and different ways of doing things. But if you ever have questions about these, you want some feedback, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server where you can ask other software developers about software architecture and design. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.